I will start at least getting the rules set up. So hello and welcome to the Global Primatology Virtual Conference hosted by Central Washington University. My name is Courtney Okwa and I will be moderating this session today. The session is with Dr. Lydia Hopper and will last until about 12.15 to 12.30. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that the session will be recorded. If you do not want to be recorded, then you may return, may you turn off your camera. Additionally, to make this a fun learning experience for everyone, I'm going to request that we all follow a few session rules. One is that one mic, one voice, only one person speaks at a time. Two, respect for all identities. This includes pronouns, nationalities, ethnic groups, etc. Three, this is a safe place. Um, do not feel discouraged. All are welcome to engage and ask questions. Um, four, only one question, please. Out of respect for others and time, please stick to asking just one question. Um, five, only speak for yourself and no one else. Six, no name calling or derogatory comments or questions of any kind. Failure to comply will result in your termination from the session. Um, seven, keep the chat clear of traffic. Please only use it to propose questions. Um, eight, we will keep all questions to the end, but you are welcome to drop your questions into the Q&A or chat session for Dr. Hopper to answer after her presentation. Now that we are all on the same page, it is time to introduce Dr. Lydia Hopper, who works at, as the Assistant Director of the Fisher Center at Lincoln Park Zoo, where she oversees research studying primatology, primate cognition and welfare. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Let me pull up my slides and, and we can get going and I will introduce myself then. I just want to say, though, looking through the list of folk who are here, it's really wonderful to see some familiar names um, and also um, people that I don't know. So hopefully I can introduce uh, new work to a new audience. OK, I think we're all up. Is this I get, yes, thank you for the thumbs up. So yeah, my name is Lydia Hopper. I'm the Assistant Director of the Lester E. Fisher Center for the Study and Conservation of Apes at Lincoln Park Zoo. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I'll give a visual description for those who um, can't see the screen. Um, I'm a white woman and I'm slim with brown hair and I'm wearing a blue button down shirt. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about the work that we do at Lincoln Park Zoo, um, how we use technology to study our primates, their cognition, their welfare, their behavior. And then I'm also going to um, pivot in the second half of the talk and talk about sort of my personal theoretical interest, which is how primates innovate and learn and how they create technologies and tools for themselves. So I know many of you, um, some of you know me, but many of you don't. And so I wanted to first introduce my sort of research philosophy and interests. So I'm a comparative psychologist by training, and I'm really interested in taking a comparative approach to understand differences both within and between species. And I'm also really interested in looking at primate decision making within the context of the physical and social worlds that the animals live in and see how that environment, whether it be physical or social, influences the choices that they make. And importantly, beyond the sort of theoretical work that I do, I'm really interested in um, applying what we learn to enhance captive primate welfare um, across a variety of um, settings. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit and I'll touch on it in the end, but, but to me, this, this duality of, of understanding primate cognition and welfare go, go hand in hand. So I said I'm from the Fisher Center at Lincoln Park Zoo. Lincoln Park Zoo is in Chicago in America. Um, we're a free zoo um, and we have been around for over 150 years. So we have a great legacy connection with our community. The Fisher Center is one of many science centers in the zoo. It's, the zoo is really um, focused on scientific decision making. And our center is focused on primates specifically. And we work with both captive and wild populations. We answer both theoretical and, sorry, my cat has joined us. Um, we answer both theoretical and applied questions. Um, and we're also really dedicated to um, providing professional development opportunities for early career scientists, both through our internship and then through our, our research assistant positions. And I'll, I'll highlight some of the work of our interns and research assistants throughout this presentation. So at Lincoln Park Zoo, our work focuses on three species, Western lowland gorillas, chimpanzees, and Japanese macaques. But we also have long-term collaborative relationships with other um, 
sites to sort of um, enhance the work that we do. So we have a long-term relationship with the um, Gulogo Triangle 8 project, where uh, we study uh, Western lowland gorillas and chimpanzees in wild settings to help conserve these populations. Um, and we also have a long-term collaboration with Chimphaven, the National Chimpanzee Sanctuary in Louisiana. And I'm not going to touch too much on these other um, sites in my talk, but I, but I will provide some examples and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about those at the end. Um, because of our sort of interest in doing comparative research and our commitment to collaborating with the scientific community, um, we have a number of different scientific partners who we work um, with for sort of one-off projects or maybe multiple sort of short-term commitments. And one that I want to highlight is the Many Primates um, Project. This is an open science collaborative uh, program where researchers from across the world are coming together to apply the same methods to test primate cognition in a truly comparative way. Um, we piloted this first uh, a couple of years ago, and now we have three active projects. So I, I definitely recommend particularly students looking up this project, because even if you don't have access to primates, there's other ways you can get involved in this um, collaborative program um, by analyzing data with us, by writing um, papers with us. So there's lots of different different ways that you can become engaged in primatology. Um, and if you just Google many primates, we have a Twitter feed and we have a, a website too that you can learn more about this process. But Lincoln Park Zoo is a proud collaborator of this program. Oh, skipped ahead. So as I said, I'm going to focus on what we do at Lincoln Park Zoo. So we predominantly study the chimpanzees and gorillas and the Japanese macaques. And our chimpanzees and gorillas live in the Regenstein Center for African Apes. And I thought um, given this is virtual, I could give you sort of a virtual tour of the space. Um, there are two chimpanzee groups and two gorilla groups, and all of their habitats sort of have the same features. They have these um, big floor to ceiling um, glass viewing windows so that um, zoo visitors can get really close with the animals. Um, it's a really accessible um, experience because the glass comes down basically to the floor. Um, everyone can can sort of get this up close and personal experience, but the glass is really, really thick. So it has sound deadening properties. So the welfare of our animals is maintained too because they're not exposed to the, to the loud sounds of the visitors. They also all have access to outdoor spaces through these large um, sliding glass doors that we, we can open up whenever the weather is fine and they have access to outside spaces. Similarly, our Japanese macaque exhibit um, is has large indoor outdoor spaces, um, very complex, diverse spaces that the that the animals can explore. Another really nice feature of all of our exhibit spaces, so this is a sort of um, a view of one of our gorilla habitats, is that they not only allow us to do the research with the animals that I'm going to talk about, but they allow us to do that research in view of zoo visitors. So what you're seeing in this photograph is in the in the back is a one of our gorillas, a silverback Kwan, participating in the touchscreen study directly in view of zoo guests. And this is being interpreted to our guests by one of our um, interpreters. And so for me as a scientist, what I really like about this is that not only do we get to share the results of our research, but we also get to share the process, what it's like to be a primatologist, what it's like to run these studies, um, and to talk about sort of our research philosophy and, and how we design the studies that we design. Um, and that's a really exciting opportunity and particularly being a free zoo. Um, so this photograph, obviously all of the photographs I'm gonna show you today are pre COVID. Um, I should say that up from the front, but because we're a free zoo, we're able to really welcome anybody that would like to come. And we often welcome folk who maybe aren't necessarily intentionally thinking that they're going to come and encounter some science. And that's a really um, great way that we can engage a really broad audience. We also um, engage in outreach in lots of other ways. So um, back in 2016, we hosted um, some scientific conferences and we, we continue to plan future conferences. We of course give lots of scientific talks like this one to share the work that we do. We produce publications in a range of settings. So in addition to sort of scientific publications, we write blog pieces, um, we're on social media, we write articles aimed at um, younger audiences to really, again, reach as many folk as we can to talk about the importance of studying primate um, cognition and welfare. And I wanted to highlight one particular effort that was a real joy to be a part of. We collaborated with an artist in um, the little village neighborhood of Chicago, and we had students, young, um, students come to the zoo, spend a day with us, learning about chimpanzees, observing the chimpanzees, 
and the children drew the chimpanzees at the end of their day. And then the artist uh, translated the children's drawings into sculptures of the chimpanzees that were um, on exhibit at the zoo and will be on exhibit in the in the community next. So this is a really nice collaboration with the communities that we work with and a way of sort of showing the interplay between art and science too. So now I want to pivot to my talk. And as I said, the, the way that I want to structure the talk is sort of first give a very top level overview of how we use technology to study primates. And then at the end, I'm going to um, talk about the technologies that, that primates use. So this is going to be a very high level. I'm not going to go into too much detail in the methodologies of the studies. But if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them at the end. But I thought it'd be more fun to sort of, you know, give a, a real um, broad picture of everything that we're doing currently at Lincoln Park Zoo. So the core technology that we use is a zoo monitor. This is a behavioral observation app um, for iOS that we developed at Lincoln Park Zoo, but it's freely um, available to other accredited zoos and sanctuaries and has been adopted worldwide. Um, at Lincoln Park Zoo, we use it to study a number of our um, species, but the Fisher Center, of course, focuses on primates. And with this tool, we record what the animals are doing every day. But we also record where they're spending time in their exhibit and who they're spending their time with. And this allows us to not only understand sort of um, their basic behavior, but also understand their welfare and if and how it's influenced by environmental factors, such as the number of visitors in the building at a given time or different sound levels. Um, you know, we're, a, we're a, a zoo right in the city. There's a lot of anthropogenic noise. So it's really important for us to study. And we've been collecting behavioral data on our um, chimpanzees and gorillas um, for uh, over 15 years now. So for some of our animals, we have data from the day they were born right through their lives. This is a really rich long-term data set. So I want to give you an example of um, how we use these data. And this uh, project was actually led by one of our research interns, Sam Earl, and she published this with us um, last year. And she was interested in the nesting behavior of our chimpanzees and gorillas and how that differed. On the left, you see um, photographs of two of the exhibits um, and their corresponding maps. And really what I want to highlight here is how similar these two exhibits are. They both have um, the same sort of superficial structure and shape. They have the same um, soft mulch bedding on the floor. They have the same access to outdoor areas. They have sort of comparable numbers of elevated sleeping areas and soft areas to sleep on the floor. And Sam was really interested in whether we would see species differences between our chimps and gorillas. Specifically, she hypothesized that the chimps would be more likely to sleep in elevated locations, whereas the gorillas would be more likely to make nests on the ground and fall asleep on the ground. Um, to also look at the impact of exhibit, we took into um, our study period a planned exhibit switch. So our keepers had planned to switch the gorillas and the chimps around. We do this to sort of enrich their lives. So we took a three month period before the switch and a matched period after the switch um, to look at how that influenced behavior as well. And much to our surprise, what we found was that um, there was no difference between the species in whether they slept in elevated or terrestrial areas, but it was actually the exhibit that drove this. Um, so here on this graph, you have the two exhibits. The, the blue panels are the chimpanzees, the yellow panels are the gorillas, and the um, y-axis shows the proportion of time that the animals are, are going to bed for the night in a, in a terrestrial or an elevated space. So the higher the box plot, the more terrestrial, sorry, the more elevated that spot is. So what you can see here is that in exhibit A, both species tended to make their nests on the floor, whereas in exhibit B, particularly for the chimpanzees, they were more likely to um, make their nests in elevated spots. And this is really fascinating given A, the differences we know between the species and B, how similar seemingly these exhibits are. But this tells us that these animals don't see them as the same space and that they must be in some way functionally or um, qualitatively different. So that's important for us to, to study further. Another piece of technology that we're sort of famous for using is touchscreen computers. Um, this is Quan, one of our silverback gorillas, um, using the touchscreen. And this sort of showcases how we test all of our animals. You can see in the background is another gorilla, Barna. And we, we for the most part, test all of our animals in their home exhibit 
in a social setting. We just present the touch screen to them and whoever chooses to come over um, can participate. And um, this has been a very successful program for us. And we were one of the first um, places to systematically um, use touch screens with gorillas. So folk had done this with obviously with chimps and rhesus macaques for many, many years. Um, but we were really proud to initiate this with gorillas um, a number of years ago. Um, one thing I want to highlight from our work, I want to just highlight just a few studies. So one of the very early projects that we did was sequencing studies to look at memory. And I think one really fascinating thing that we found more recently with our tasks of memory with the touchscreen is that we find bigger individual differences than species differences. So this graph here shows um, accuracy responses from um, Japanese macaques in the lighter green and gorillas in the darker green. Um, and as you can see, there's a, there's a real mix here. And really what predicts success is who the individual is, not what their species is. And we find these individual differences consistently in a, in a variety of our data. So another example here is we have used the touchscreen um, computers to test the primates' food preferences. We do this by presenting photographs of food in pairs on the screen. Whichever the animals pick, they get. We present a number of different pairwise combinations of lots of different foods. And then we can see which they preferentially um, select in all combinations. These are data from one of our um, gorillas, um, and we tested his food preferences at two time points, six months apart. And on this graph, basically, the higher the food is up the line, the more often it's selected, so the more often it, so the more it is preferred. And what you can take away here is that for this gorilla, his preferred food is great, but that his preferences are really consistent over time. But when we look at data for lots of different individuals, this is six of our gorillas. What we see is that there's huge variation, both in the order of their preferences, but also the strength of their preferences. So um, second from the left is Azizi and then Kwan. So Azizi's favorite food is grape, Kwan's is tomatoes. Um, but the next two gorillas along in this graph, Mosey and Raleigh, their um, foods are all sort of clustered together. This means that they weren't really picking one over the other. Um, they were all sort of just happy to pick whichever food came up. So it's really important for us and we can use these data now. Um, this is not just with sort of scientific interest, but we now use these data to um, help with the training for future tasks. So we're able to give Quan, for example, cherry tomatoes now as his reinforcer because we now know that's his preferred food. We also use the touch screens to test welfare in a number of different ways. And I'm gonna sort of highlight some different ways that we've done it. We've used the touch screens themselves to create tasks, so cognitive bias tasks and Stroop tests, to actually ask questions about the primate's mood and um, to ask about their responses to emotional stimuli. We have also looked at the animal's behavior while they're completing tasks to look at their welfare in the moment as they're completing the tasks. And what this has shown us is that there's no real difference between simple and difficult tasks, but we do notice that they show anxiety behavior, so self scratch mild anxiety behaviors when they get an answer wrong. So again, we're, we're constantly monitoring how they're responding to the testing itself. That's really important to us. Another factor at a zoo, of course, is the presence of visitors. And there's a lot of work looking at how visitor behavior influences zoo animal welfare, but less work has focused on how maybe it um, influences their decision making. And so we wanted to take advantage of our cognitive testing to explore this. So this photograph, again, pre-COVID, is a sh photograph of one of the viewing visitor viewing shelters of our macaque exhibit. And I, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but at the left of the photograph is the macaque exhibit. And directly from their habitat, they can enter into one of two um, cognitive testing booths um, that's directly in view of the visitors here. And you can see Sarah Huskisson, one of our research assistants administering a task, and one of our interpreters interpreting a task. And so we started a new task and Sarah, in addition to um, administering the task, also in real time counted the number of people in the booth. This was a real um, challenge for Sarah as it was for our monkeys. So these are the data. So for the first three months of the task, um, this was a match to sample task, the monkeys performed right at chance. This was a new task to them. They didn't know it, they were still learning it. By the second period of the task though, the second three months of the period, the monkey's performance had significantly improved, but 
their success was mediated by the number of people viewing them participate in the task, such that when there were over 40 people in this viewing area, their, su their success was significantly reduced. So this, again, is important for us to consider both when we're interpreting the data and when we're considering the monkey's welfare. The last piece of technology that I want to highlight that we're using at the zoo now, we've just started using in the last couple of years, is um, eye tracker, and I'm going to give a more concrete example later on um, in this talk about um, the eye trackers. But this is a photograph again of Quan. He's my beautiful model for today, um, viewing some stimuli on a screen while an eye tracker is passively um, recording what he's looking at for how long. Um, and inset here is a photograph that we have shown him. This is a photograph of his daughter, Bella, and the green circles here show gaze points. So time, points in time when his eyes have sort of landed and looked at a particular area. And what you can see here is that he was not only looking at the photograph of Bella, but that he was really focused on her face. And this is really similar to patterns we see in people that when we show people um, pictures of other people, we tend to look at the face. This is a really important area of information for us. Um, I also want to highlight how we're using technology with our partner institutions. So I mentioned earlier that we have a long term collaboration with Chimp Haven, the National Chimpanzee Sanctuary. It's home to over 300 chimpanzees. And as part of our collaboration, we have a member of um, Lincoln Park Zoo staff based at Chimp Haven full time. And the current project that we're working on funded by the Arcus Foundation is to evaluate and develop novel um, welfare assessment tools. So we have a number of different projects going on, but one that's sort of technology based that I wanted to highlight today is the use of thermal imaging cameras. So to highlight how this works, this is a photograph of a tree with a chimp in it taken with just a regular camera. And I can see where the chimp is because I know where she is, but I'm guessing for everyone else, it's not clear. But when we view the tree through the thermal imaging camera, we can we can instantly see the chimpanzee glowing um, white. So this is sort of a very um, broad strokes way of how thermal imaging can be used. But we've also shown other ways in which it can be deployed. So, for example, this is a chimpanzee there. And again, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, he's got his head down looking towards us with his head. And there's his ear on one side, his right ear. Um, on our left is the color it should be, sort of a dark purpley color. But his left ear, the ear to the right for us, is glowing white. And this is because he had an ear infection. And we were able to monitor that with the thermal imaging camera and track his recovery in real time just by taking a photograph each day and um, measuring the course of his recovery. We've also been able to use the thermal imaging camera to look at changes, other sort of physiological changes in response to um, different behaviors. And we have that. Those data are currently in prep. Hopefully, we'll submit that this month. The other um, technology that I wanted to highlight with our partners was at our field site in the Republic of Congo. So the Gulogo Triangle 8 project team has a series of motion activated camera traps that are put out throughout the forest. And these allow us to passively monitor the behavior of the animals there. So our target, of course, is the chimpanzees looking at their tool use behavior, but we're also able to do really detailed biodiversity surveys and other assessments of forest health by using the camera trap footage that we can, we can obtain. Just taking a look at time, we're great. Okay, so that really was a, a whirlwind of, of the different technologies that we use, um, but hopefully it gave you some ideas of how we, we use the technology. Um, I think it gives us sort of novel insights that we weren't able to get before, and particularly when we use these technologies in combination. Um, I think that's when we can get the most rich understanding of how our animals are feeling and what they're thinking and how they're making the decisions that they do. So at this point, I want to sort of pivot. This is sort of two talks in one. And I want to talk now about chimpanzee innovation and um, social learning. And I'm focusing on chimpanzees, but I will provide um, examples from other primate species too. So my research interest is, is this scenario. If we consider an individual primate, we know that they are influenced by members of their social group. And in turn, they influence members of their social troop. And of course, this isn't just linear, but there's feedbacks too. And these arrows here could represent a number of different influences or transmission points. So this could be um, disease transmission, for example. It could be 
as is the case in my research focus, the transmission of information or behaviors or skills. It could also be, though, the transmission and contagion of um, emotions and well being. So, um, fear, for example, or um, positive affect can also um, be sort of socially contagious in this way. So, that's what is really interesting to me is how is this individual who is surrounded by all of these influences, how do they make their decisions? What do they choose to do? And I think this photograph sort of nicely sums it up. This is a very um, classic photograph. This is from a Wolfgang Kurler's book, The Mentality of Apes. Wolfgang Kurler was um, a German uh, researcher back in the 20s who had a colony of captive chimpanzees on the island of Tenerife. Um, and he studied the chimpanzees problem solving among many other things. Um, but this is an example of one of his sort of very classic um, studies in which he hung bananas from the ceiling of the chimpanzees habitat to see if they could figure out how to get the bananas. And what you'll see here is that one chimpanzee has figured out that if they stack boxes below the banana, they can reach up and grab the banana. But what's of interest to me in this photograph is that you have two different sort of roles going on. You have the, the individual that has solved the problem, the so-called inventor, and you have three onlookers who are observing the behavior of the inventor. And this is really important because this is how many, many animals learn. We don't each individually learn everything for ourselves, but we look to see what others are doing. And this is important because it helps us save time and it helps us avoid risks. Um, you know, certain behaviors could be potentially fatal or certainly risky and certainly time consuming. And so by seeing what others are doing, we can then um, copy them and sort of take shortcuts. We, we don't need to sort of reinvent the wheel each time. And so that's the work that sort of I, I have been studying is what sort of facilitates this um, transmission of information, what limits it and what mediates it. The other thing that I want to note when we're thinking about the inventor in this scenario, though, is that invention in itself is inherently social. I think we have this sort of fallacy idea of these sort of so-called heroic inventors. So we think of um, we think of inventions, and they are often culturally attributed to single people, and typically white men. Traditionally, this is the idea that these single people came up with an idea and they this is all thanks to them. Um, but there's been a lot of pushback against this and rightly so, because a lot of human innovation is very collaborative in nature. We come together in teams, we work together and that's how we innovate. And so it's really not down to just one person. And even if the process isn't actively social in that nature, no individual is living in a cultural vacuum. We are all influenced by the social worlds that we live in. And that informs our decision making and it informs what we invent and the decisions that we make. And this is how multiple discoveries come up or co-invention. So when two people of a similar time period or from a similar cultural space come up with either identical or certainly very similar ideas. For a classic example, is a natural selection. Some of the ideas that Alfred Russell Wallace came up with around the same time as Charles Darwin. There's, there's many parallels. There's differences, key differences, but there are also parallels. And this is not because one was copying the other. It's because they lived in the same space. They lived in the same Victorian era of capitalism that was promoting um, individual success and the flourishing of business. And this sort of led to these, these ideas. And so I think thinking about even the invention part of social learning as social itself is is really key. So what I'm going to talk about today is the innovation process itself. So some of the questions I'm interested in is who innovates? When do people innovate? How do they innovate? And then more potentially more interestingly as well is what promotes the transmission of those inventions and what promotes the maintenance um, of inventions within communities or what disrupts that along way. So first of all, I want to talk about what is an invention. You know, um, I think we often think about it as the creation of something new, the sort of the proverbial sliced bread. Um, but it can also be um, the repurposement of something um, in a new way. So here there's a shopping cart or a shopping trolley. 
being used to grill some meat. Um, it can be the combination of new things, uh, I'm sorry, existing things to create something new, or it can even be the refinement of something that exists to create some, a new product from that. So I want us to, again to think very broadly about what we mean by innovation. I also want to point out that for me, I think when we sometimes think about human innovation, we often think about products that people are spotting gaps in the market and trying to sort of make a profit. And that really doesn't translate to the way that animals um, innovate. And so when I think about animal innovation, I look to um, studies of user innovators. So Eric von Hippel from MIT has done a lot of work on this. And this is the innovative process where people are just trying to solve their own needs. And we, we see this all the time. People customize sporting equipment, for example. And this is not a new idea. Adam Smith wrote about this in The Wealth of Nations. Um, he talked about laborers who um, modified the equipment they were given to make their lives easier, to make the task um, more efficient. So we see people refining and innovating all the time just to you know, solve their own needs. And uh, I wrote a paper a couple of years ago with Andrew Torrance, where we argue that this is a really a more useful analogy to think about animal innovation if we're trying to look at it from a comparative perspective. And this is because when we look to primate innovation, for example, the innovations that we see are typically pretty self-serving. They're not creating a product and taking it back to their group and saying, hey guys, look what, look what I found. We, we should all be doing this now. And, and maybe things do get adopted, but it, it's not intentional on the part innovator. So here we have examples from left to right of a chimpanzee using a stream to inspect their teeth. In the middle photograph we have the classic example from Jane Goodall where um, a younger male started doing buttress drumming on oil drum cans that were um, at the camp because when he did the um, buttress drumming on these oil cans. It made a much louder sound and it gave him a much more impressive display. So his behavior wasn't new, but the way he um, produced it was new. And on the right is another really classic example. This is a Japanese macaque. Um, and the Japanese macaques in the 50s were studied by Japanese researchers on the island of Koshima. And the researchers there put um, potatoes, sweet potatoes on the beach to sort of encourage the monkeys to come out of the forest so that they could study the monkeys behavior more easily. And one of the monkeys very quickly learned to wash the now sandy potatoes in, in the sea edge to sort of clean the potatoes before she ate them and, and the rest of the group followed suit. And I also want to, to point out that the Japanese researchers themselves were pretty innovative for the time because the reason they were able to study this innovation and transmission in such a detailed way was because they named each of the monkeys. Um, and this is an era when we typically think of, um, of uh, animal researchers not naming their animals, not anthropomorphizing, but the Japanese researchers named all the animals. And this is what allowed them to track them as individuals and allowed them to see who was learning from whom. So I think this is a really sort of nice double case of, of innovative processes here. So at Lincoln Park Zoo, we study innovation in a number of different ways. And I, I'm gonna give you two examples today. One is by sort of just seeding spontaneous innovations. And the way we do this is we provide our primates with sort of the raw materials that they need to produce a behavior that we see their wild counterparts perform. And we do this to see if they will spontaneously start performing the behavior. Um, and this allows us to understand how they innovate and, and whether things sort of naturally arise or whether you need social learning to learn them. Uh, but the other benefit of this is because we're promoting these sort of naturally occurring behaviors, this is a very enriching um, practice for our, for our primates. So um, for example, we give um, branches and tools that our chimpanzees, sorry, branches that our chimpanzees can make tools out of. We look at how they create the tools. You can see here examples where they frayed the ends that they use in our artificial termite mound. We've looked at how they sort of combine tools, use tools in succession like tool sets. Um, and on the right here, we also ran a potato washing study with our Japanese macaques to see if and how the monkeys would clean potatoes that we gave them that were covered in sand. Another way that we study innovation and problem solving with the primates at Lincoln Park Zoo is sort of through more controlled experimental designs. So um, this is one such example. This is a study um, where we have a clear tube here um, shown sort of in 
phase one task configuration on the left here. It's a clear tube with paper straws threaded through it um, and a food reward above the fourth straw. And the tube sort of feeds into the um, animals exhibit. And we ran this study with our chimps and our gorillas. And what we wanted to see was, would the animals spontaneously pull out the straws to allow the food to drop down into their um, habitat? And if they did, were they sort of um, efficient about it? Would they only pull out the straws below the food reward? Um, and what we found was that the chimpanzees and gorillas spontaneously solved the task and spontaneously went for the most efficient method. So they didn't just grab all the straws, pull out all the straws. They only pulled out the straws below the food. And we gave them to this on multiple occasions till they became sort of really almost habitual in their response. Then we switched the location of the food. Now it's above the second, um, the second straw here. And what we find here is that the um, chimpanzees and gorillas, again, they didn't skip a beat. They pivoted. They now only pulled out two straws. So we can see this on the graph on the left. Phase one and phase two, the dark squares here are the chimpanzees, the paler blue squares are the gorillas in this box plot. And um, you've got the percentage um, of efficiently solved trials on the y-axis. And by efficient, we mean only pulling out straws below the food reward and not just pulling out all of them. And so you can see equal efficiency across both um, tasks. I'm a comparative psychologist. I'm always interested how we compare with our non-human primate cousins. So we also ran this um, young children, so two, three, and four-year-old children shown respectively here in the different colored box plots. Um, the graph setup is the same. The task was the same for the children. And what we found here was that it was really only the four-year-old children that were um, good at um, solving the task efficiently. And interestingly, again, it was only those four-year-olds that were really showed that ability to pivot to the new um, solution when we changed the task configuration. Um, and this is interesting because this allows us to look at this from a developmental standpoint and from a comparative standpoint. Okay, so those are some examples of how we study innovation and problem solving. And then the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about um, the transmission process and social learning and how these inventions, if inventions arise, how do they get transmitted within a group? So what is social learning? So I turn to this definition by Celia Hayes. Um, this was published back in 1994, but I think it still stands. It's a very broad definition, but I think it's helpful. I think this broad um, approach allows us to really um, apply it comparatively and to really ask some nice nuanced questions that follow on from that. But essentially, social learning is um, when an animal learns, when they're influenced by either the direct observation of another's actions or some indirect inference of the actions of another. So for example, if we take the example of nutcracking, a chimpanzee could in theory learn how to nutcrack from observing another individual nutcrack, or maybe they could come across the, cruck, the cracked nuts and hammers left by another individual and maybe that would induce learning. Um, so that, this is the broad umbrella term. And as humans, we use social learning and social information all the time. We use it to decide where to eat, what to eat, and how to eat. But we also use social information in a, in a very partic particular way that I think is somewhat different from most other animals, certainly to the degree and scope with which we use it. And that's teaching, active pedagogy, whereby an individual takes time to show another individual how to do something. And so this is at a cost to the teacher. They're taking time and effort um, to modify their actions to, to teach others. And, and while there are examples of teaching in, in non-human animals, um, it is certainly not as pervasive um, or to the degree that we see in, in humans. So why is social learning interesting? I think, you know, one of the reasons that it has really captured a lot of people's um, attention is the idea that it can lead to local behavioral traditions or cultures. Um, in 1999, um, a team of chimpanzee researchers gathered data from a number of chimpanzee field sites and compared the behaviors that were present at some and absent in others. And what they found was that the chimpanzee behavioral repertoire was not universal across field sites and that there were differences across them. 
And the paper concluded that these behaviors, many of these behaviors were potentially cultural in that they were socially learned and transmitted down generations. So some examples here, um, stone tool nut cracking that we see in the top left. And another example that doesn't involve the environment is the grooming hand clasp shown down here in the right. And I'd, I'd love to point out that this grooming hand clasp picture um, I actually took this at Lincoln Park Zoo. This is two of our Lincoln Park Zoo chimpanzees performing the grooming hand clasp. Um, I've only seen it one time in nearly nine years of working at the zoo. So again, this shows the importance of long-term study, but I'm thrilled that I not only saw it, but also actually had a camera on hand at the time. But as rich as this data set is, and, and in fact, this, this method, it's the, um, this method of elimination has been used now with a number of different primate species, it certainly has limitations and it's often tricky to rule out environmental influences or to really drill down into how, if and how social learning is driving um, the behavioral patterns that we see. And so for that, I think this is where experimental work, whether in the field or in captivity, can really help us tease apart some of those um, transmission pathways. And so I work with captive primates, but there are many beautiful examples of experimental work um, with wild primates too. Um, but I'm, I'm going to focus on my work with, with captive primates. So in my mind, there are sort of four real ways you can run an experiment to look at social learning. The first is looking at dyads. So you can train individual A to perform a behavior and see if individual B learns from them. You can replicate this multiple times, kind of like the telephone game and see if you get sort of repeated transmission across individuals. The third method is called the replacement method. And here you get a, a sort of laboratory population, a mini group of individuals, and you see the behavior in that group and you iteratively remove and replace individuals in these groups until the final population has none of the founding members in it. And you see if the behavior persists, even though the founding members are no longer present. And the last method is the open diffusion method. This is probably the most naturalistic. It's also the, the messiest from an from a administrative and data perspective. But here you train a single individual, you reintroduce them to their group, and you see if and who copies the individual that you're reintroducing. So this sort of, you're sort of trying to here experimentally seed um, sort of a, a spontaneous uh, invention, but you're controlling what is invented in that in that moment. Um, and I also want to highlight that again throughout my talk I'm going to focus on the transmission of, of skills and behaviors and, and tool use um, techniques but but this social influence this social influence can really be um, uh, expressed in a number of different ways. So um, in a project that I ran in collaboration with Nico Credia, we looked at um, chimpanzee food sharing and we showed that um, social influence could encourage chimpanzees to food share. So chimpanzees that were not likely to share food with their partners, after we sort of rigged the apparatus so it seemed as if their partner had shared food with them, then that individual was in turn more likely to share food with another individual in, in the future. And this was important because this was downstream reciprocity. So A shared with B and that made B more likely to share with C. So this wasn't reciprocal altruism. Um, so it was really interesting that we got those carryover effects. So the questions that I answer, uh, try to answer are, what is the role of social learning in learning? So to put it simply, like if you give an animal a task, can they solve it spontaneously through trial and error? And if they can't, does seeing another individual solve that task allow them to solve it themselves? So that's sort of the first part. So does social learning help learning? And the second part is, does that social information lead to copying? So here we have a task um, that, and if you look in the center, it's a box with a door in the middle. Um, it's a very simple task. The door can move either to the left or to the right. Either way you move it, it reveals a hole out of which a food reward falls. So it doesn't matter which way you move it, you're going to get that food reward either way. But what I'm interested in here is if you see the door move to the left, do you just learn that, oh, the door moves? Or do you learn that the door moves and you also learn that it moves to the left specifically? So um, there's a number of different ways that we can sort of um, tease apart these questions. So I want to start first with that complicated open diffusion technique that I talked about to sort of show some of the sort of um, 
key fundamentals of uh, social information. Um, so here in this graph, a data from um, a study with squirrel monkeys that I ran a number of years ago. Um, and I don't need to unpack the graph too much, but basically from left to right, they're getting less and less social information. And we see that their success decreases the amount of, so as you get more social information, more social support, your likelihood of success increases. Um, and we see in a sort of open diffusion group session. So here, this is two groups of gray bars and black bars represent two different groups of squirrel monkeys. Again, an individual was trained on one method in one group and another method in another group. And we see that the matching over time is pretty good, but there's, it's not 100% fidelity. We see these corruptions, or we could think of them as innovations, right? That the, the animals are finding new ways to solve the task. Um, and these are, this is another example. This is two groups of chimpanzees. This was a pretty complex tool use task. Um, with two different methods. And again, if there was 100% fidelity of matching, the top graph should be all black bars and the bottom graph should be all white bars. And that's not what we see. We see differences, um, different individuals using both techniques. So even though they were never shown it, they discovered these other techniques. So this interplay between the social information and the individual innovation is, is always happening. So. So I would say that the social port, social support fosters exploration and learning, but not necessarily copying. Um, but to sort of tease apart the copying in a more detailed way, we sort of need a more um, controlled experimental design. And that's where these dynamic um, tasks come into play. So this is where you have one individual watching a second individual. And this is a pretty old study of mine that I ran back in 2008. And this is with children and with chimpanzees. So children saw another child, chimpanzees saw another chimpanzee. And the task that I used is that task that I described in the previous but one slide, this box with the door that can slide either to the left or to the right. And so half of the children saw another child push the door to the left, half of the children saw another child push the door to the right, and the same for the chimpanzees. And what we found was that after watching a social model, the children and chimpanzees were very successful. They all solved the task. And somewhat surprisingly for me, they all really faithfully copied the direction that the door had been moved into, even though, as I said, it's completely arbitrary. So there's something interesting here. It's almost like, um, you know, sort of a norm forming. And in fact, when it, these are three and four year old children, and I'm, I can't ask the chimps, but when I asked the children, you know, why did you push the door to the left or, or to the right, depending on their group? They were all like, well, because that's how you do it. And they would look at me like, well, come on, Lydia, this is so obvious. Of course you push it to the left. And then I would ask them, well, if you pushed it to the right, do you think you would have also got the reward? And they looked at me, they were like, oh yeah, but we push it to the left. And so this is young children and they'd only seen a few demonstrations. And so this was really intriguing to me. What was it that they were learning about this? And so then I ran a follow-up study um, which is called a ghost display, where again, different children, different chimpanzees saw the same task, but instead of a, a conspecific demonstrator moving the door, it moved automatically. So what I wanted to see was, do you need to see another individual move that door or, does, or are you just learning about how the door moves? So these are those results. Um, and what we found here, children and chimpanzees equally successful as when they'd seen a conspecific model move the door or ghost display condition. But their likelihood of copying fell way down. So now they, if they saw the door move to the left or the right, they didn't necessarily copy that direction. So this was really interesting to me. And I've done a series of follow-up studies with different tasks, with different levels of social support, and I keep getting the same results that the ghost display encourages exploration, but it doesn't um, facilitate copying. So what is it about this social model? Um, Okay, I've got a few, I'm just gonna wrap up in a few more minutes and talk about this, I'm mindful of the time. Um, so what is it about the social model? So one thought that I had was that the social model might be more um, engaging. And this is a study I ran in collaboration with Lauren Howard. And so maybe they look at it more. Another is maybe that they encode the information more when it comes from a social model. And this, this idea came from some work that Lauren had done with young human infants interplay between memory and learning through EEG studies. And so the way we teased apart these questions was we showed this was chimpanzees and gorillas at Lincoln Park Zoo. 
we showed them a video of either a, a social model, so in this case, a hand building a tower, or a non-social model, a claw building a tower. And we used our eye tracker to look at their attention to these different um, demonstrations to see was one more salient or interesting to the chimps and gorillas than the other. And then to look at the effect of memory, we did a looking time paradigm. And what this is, is you show the animals the tower being built, and then you show them that tower paired with a new tower. And in looking time paradigm, this is a paradigm that's used with young infants. This has been around since the 80s. It's also been used with many primate species too. That if you have remembered the information in a video, that tower is now old and boring to you. And so you look more at the new novel tower. And so if you see that an animal is looking more at the new thing, the inference is that they have remembered the old thing. So what did we find? When we looked at their attention to the videos, we found that they looked equally to the social and the non-social videos. Um, however, when we look at what they're looking at, they're more likely to look at the thing building the tower than the tower, but, but both videos were equally engaging. But interestingly, we only found an effect of memory, so um, looking more at the novel tower in the social condition. So this suggests that that model with agency has an interplay with the ape's memory for this event. So this is really interesting to me, and, and, and I think there's this neat interplay here between memory and sociality. And so if we know that social models are important, I think some of the next questions are like, well, does it matter who that social model is? And so um, in collaboration with Rachel Kendall, I've done a number of um, experiments looking into this, and we find that chimps are more likely to copy the majority, high-ranking individuals and experts. And that individuals who are um, of low rank and female, or those who are uncertain, haven't yet solved the task, are also more likely to seek out information. So we do see differences. They're not just sort of copying any old individual, they're being selective about who they copy and when they copy. And that's useful and important that you, you're not just sort of um, indiscriminately copying anybody. I've also been involved in some collaborations more recently as well, looking at sort of the influence of the social group both within and between species differences on the structure of the social group and its likelihood to facilitate that flow of information and the connections there. And um, again, I'm, I'm happy to sort of talk about this in more detail, but I just wanna highlight that the, the social group you live in, so even if you want that social information, can you get it is, is always another question and can you express that information once you've learned it? I think some future questions that remain unanswered are chimpanzees and other primates seem really good at paying attention to others and to um, exploiting behavior, that they, information that they get socially. Um, but we don't really see cumulative culture the same way that we do in human social learning. And cumulative culture is this iterative improvement. So as we copy, we're also refining and improving um, the technologies and the tools that we copy, such that we now have technologies that a single individual couldn't invent from scratch if they were sort of culturally naive, that we really need the information from previous generations. And I, I think that's sort of an interesting question as to, as to why this seems to be unique for humans. And I, I want to highlight sort of a, a fun um, tidbit that I, I think this is true and I'm I'm yet to be challenged on it and I would love to I would love to hear if this is not the case, but to my knowledge, we are the only species that um, also not only uses tools, but creates tools to make other tools. So many, many you know, animals, different species, birds and dolphins and other primate species use tools. But as far as I know, we are the only species that create tools to make other tools. Um, there's many examples of that. This here is a, is a tool that makes drill bits, for example. So this to me is, is a real question is, is like, what, what is it that has allowed us to go from a slate to a tablet in a relatively short period of time, when in that same time frame, chimpanzee tools have remained pretty static in terms of their form. Um, and so this is something with Claudio Tenia that we've been sort of um, questioning. And I, I think there's lots of different, potentially not even mutually exclusive um, factors that might explain this. So these are some of the future questions that I have. And I, I think a lot of it is about how the social bonds of a group facilitate or prohibit social information transmission. And how can we 
um, characterize and understand those social bonds and what does it mean for the animals within them um, and how they sort of are influenced by the behavior of others. And this bottom point is something that I haven't yet tackled, but I would love to, which is what is the trade off between being socially connected such that you have priority access to the information, but with increased contact with others also comes an increased risk of disease transmission. And this is, these are questions that others have, have tackled, but it's something that I am also really interested in looking into in the future. I also want to flag that I, as I said at the beginning, I'm always really interested in understanding how we can apply this information to better care for captive animals. And um, I just published a study uh, sorry, not a study, a, a review article considering the different ways that we could sort of leverage social learning to um, enhance the behavioral management of captive animals. So I was trying to consider really all um, captive animals across settings. So in zoos, in labs, in um, sanctuaries and in agricultural settings too. So um, I'm, I'm always happy to have feedback on this because these are some new ideas that I'm um, mulling at the moment. So I want to wrap up, make sure we have time for questions, but I just want to say that um, sort of in summary that, you know, for me as a scientist working at a zoo, it's a real joy because I get to meet the zoo's mission, which is more than just what goes on on grounds. We have our conservation work. We have, as I said, our on grounds work, but also the opportunities for outreach and public engagement that to me are really, really exciting. And I also want to thank the Fisher Center team. I mean, I've been talking about the work that I've been doing here. It is, it is not just me. This is not a solo effort. This is a team effort. Um, so our center director, Steve, um, Dave Morgan from the Gulogo Triangle A project, our research coordinator, Christina Doling, and our research assistants, Sarah, Jesse, and Ben. Um, most of the work that I have presented today, they, they have led or um, certainly been involved in. And um, yeah, it's as with primates, studying how they hang out together for me as a, as a human primate, it's, it's all about collaboration and I want to thank them too. So thanks very much. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see everybody and take any questions. Okay, so for the question portion, feel free to either raise your hand um, or drop it in the chat or Q&A. So we do have some questions in the chat. So to start, uh, Raymond asks, um, for the straw tube problem solving task, were the children told what to do or did they have to figure out how to solve the problem by themselves? Oh, that is a great, that is a really good question. Um, and I think this applies to a lot of comparative work with humans and with non-human primates. And I am always thinking about how can I make it as comparative and as fair as possible. Um, so no we don't so we can't tell the chimps and gorillas what to do um they are motivated to do it in a, it is a grape or a peanut in the tube so they are motivated to get that so the way we work with the children is again we we show them so the the thing that fell down for the children was a small ball but before doing the study we showed them that if they gave us the ball, they could get a sticker in return. So very quickly we established that the ball is something you want to try and get. And then we put the ball in the tube and they were very motivated to get it in the same way that the um, animals had been with the food. That was a sort of spontaneous thing. So we, we do that training. Um, I think more broadly, I think it's really important to think about if you're, if you're doing comparative work to think about all of the species from the get go, I think where I've done things in the past that haven't worked is I've designed it either for chimps and then tried to retrofit it for children, or I thought about it for children and tried to retrofit it for chimps and it never quite works. And so I always try and come in and think about how will this apply and even sort of physical things. So our chimps um, and our gorillas, of course, at the zoo are doing everything through mesh, the, the, the perimeter of their habitats. And that of course limits how they can access things and so i try and do the same with the children too so i don't put children in cages but i do often put a sort of a screen a mesh screen between the child and the task um, or put the task itself in some sort of um, enclosure so that again their movement is restricted in the same way because i don't want the kids to do better just because they have like this 360 access to the task that the primates don't so yeah ray that's a really really good question thank you Okay, and then um, 
Robin asks, can you please let me know the names of your studies involving technology, specifically touchscreens and visitor effect? Or I guess how to look for those. <laughs> Yes, so um, absolutely. So yeah, the, the visitor effect touchscreen one um, that just came out, it came out in animal cognition. Um, so if you search for my last name in the journal animal cognition, um, I don't, can I drop it? I can maybe can drop it in the chat. Let me see. I'll multitask. And in that paper, um, we talk about a lot of um, the other touchscreen work that we have done. So that should be a good reference. I'm just going to pull it up here and see if I can drop this link in the chat. Okay, chat. Okay, hopefully that works for everyone. I did it as a Google file, so it shouldn't be behind a paywall. It should be um, accessible to everybody that, that describes that study. And I should say that was sort of a pilot study. We just had four monkeys and um, this was before COVID, so we have taken advantage of COVID, and we are now currently running a, a, a follow-up where we were able to collect data while the zoo was closed, and we're now collecting data now the zoo is back open. Um, we're testing our entire group of monkeys, and we're collecting additional data too now, so we're also collecting sound level data, um, because maybe, because you know when there's more people and the monkeys did less well, Maybe that's because it was louder, or maybe because the people were closer to the monkeys. So we're trying to collect a sort of a, a richer data set now. So we're collecting data on sound levels. We've got a microphone out there every day. We're also collecting data on, we're actually using Zoom Monitor to see where the visitors are in the space as well. So is it just that they're in that viewing shelter or is it that they're bunched up by the where the monkeys are? And again, to really get a more nuanced understanding. So um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have data on that fairly soon to answer it in a more detailed way. Wonderful. And then um, again about the technology, um, A. Gray uh, asks or says that the thermal imaging camera you showed looks really incredible and useful. Um, they would like to know if you are able to share what brand or model you use. Yeah, so we used, um, I can't remember the model off the top of my head, but it's FLIR, which is F-L-I-R. And they make a variety of different models of different price points. So there's some pretty relatively for, for technology, relatively affordable ones for like around 150 to 200 dollars, um, all the way up to thousands and thousands of dollars. We went for a sort of a mid point one. Um, and really the, the difference across those levels is the resolution. Um, of the photograph. So it really depends what you want to look at. So, so for example, I showed you the chimp in the tree. You really need just very low resolution for that. that. Any model could do that. The same with the chimpanzee's ears. You don't need particularly high resolution for that. Um, but if you're looking for something more nuanced, so we're, there's a lot of work suggesting that if you sort of look at nasal temperature, um, that changes with behavior and maybe with different affective states um, because of um, blood flow. So for that, you need a much higher resolution camera, particularly if we were working with sanctuary chimpanzees that could be anywhere in their habitat, right? So we needed to be able to zoom and have pretty high resolution. So for that, we, yeah, we used a, a slightly a better camera for that. But we, I think what we did was um, we bought one that was sort of an outgoing model so we could get it cheaper. Um, so that was one way of doing it. But yeah, I think you can even get sort of just attachments for your smartphone now too. That's very useful to know. Um, and then Juliet is asking, have you done any studies with rodents? And I, if you don't mind, will add mm. on to that. Uh, what other animals besides primates have you ever studied? Mm. Yeah, um, no, I would, I would love to. Um, yeah, so I've mostly worked with primates and I've worked with a variety of primate species. So um, yeah, different macaque species, squirrel monkeys, owl monkeys, and chimps and gorillas at the zoo and the Japanese macaques at the zoo. Um, I haven't done any work with rodents, but I do have a number of projects going on with birds, actually. And I have a master's student. She just graduated. Um, we're looking at wild bird cognition. So sort of problem solving and innovating. Um, and we were studying wild birds across different urban gradients in Chicago. So from downtown Chicago to out into sort of more rural areas in Illinois and looking at how the local environment um, influenced um, problem solving and neophobia. So yeah, I think birds, birds in general, I find really interesting. And I always joke that if I would do my PhD 
yeah, again, I would do with corvids and ravens and crows. I think they're super fascinating. But yeah, I've never worked with rodents though, but I would be happy to do so. I'm I'm really a generalist. I'm just I'm driven by questions. Um, so yeah. And so at the zoo, it's been fun because particularly through the Many Primates Project, I've been able to work with other species at the zoo. So I've been working with the swamp monkeys, for example, and we're hoping to start with the lemurs soon. So it's it, that's been that's been a real joy. Wonderful. Um, and then Robin asks, do you plan to expand your touchscreen study with visitors and monkeys to chimpanzees and gorillas? Yeah, so we. Um, so the so looking at the visitor effects on the chimps and girls, yeah, we we would love to. So right now we are we're really kind of limited by COVID. So our eight building is closed to the public, so there are no visitors um, to protect the animals, um, of course. And so um, right now we can't collect those data, but I am hoping in the future that we can because I think that would be really really important. It's interesting, I should say, we, we did a cognitive bias study a few years ago to sort of look at mood responses to, we have a big air and water show every year in Chicago um, with, you know, plane displays and it literally is over the zoo. The zoo is on the beach and so the planes are right over, we are like the epicenter of this display. And so um, Katie Cronin at Lincoln Park Zoo ran a study looking at, um, yeah, using a cognitive bias paradigm, looking at mood and emotion during this air and water show. And we did it with all three species. And the macaques showed a really strong stress response to the planes, unsurprisingly. They had just arrived at the zoo the year before, so it was new to them. The chimps and gorillas had been there for many, many more years, and they didn't show such a response. And so, again, with all negative results, we don't know whether that's because they were habituated to the air and water show or if um the paradigm just didn't work for them um but yeah i think i think it would be really interesting to do, to do the touchscreen visitor stuff i can say we use our behavioral data so one one study we've looked at for example is where the anim where the chimpanzees and gorillas spend their time in their exhibit depending on the number of people in the building directly in the building and their behavior does not change so they don't like avoid the glass when there are more people in the exhibit they don't they don't seem to show any behavioral changes. And I, I think that's just a credit to how the exhibit is designed. It's very complex. As I said, the glass is very thick. There's lots of places that they can go and hide if they want to. Um, yeah, so, but no, definitely would like, my, my aim is everything that I do with one species, I try and do with all of the species. Wonderful. Um, and then Raymond has a two part question. Uh, have you noticed any of your primates experiencing research fatigue? or whether the touch screen has become a secondary reinforcer that the primates are using it regardless of food reward? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, haven't noticed any research fatigue. Um, so yeah, it's all voluntary and the participation. So I should say we have some animals who never choose to use the touch screen at all. So some animals never do. So we have two Japanese macaques one has used it maybe three times, one has never used it. And the same with our chimps and gorillas. Some just choose never to use it. And I think what's really interesting is one of our chimps, Nana, has for all intents and purposes never used the touchscreen, but is like a pro at all of our tool use tasks. So it's not that she's avoiding us or doesn't want to do testing, but for whatever reason, the touchscreen isn't for her. Um, but so yeah, for, but for the animals that do use it regularly, they come every day, they choose to do it every day. Um, as far as the reinforce it, yeah, we give them food rewards. They're very small food rewards and um, they typically eat everything. So I think the food reward is important. But when we were doing the food preference testing, sometimes the pairs of foods were two unpreferred foods. So celery turnip was like, a slog to get through <laughs> because they didn't want celery or turnip. And so they just had to press something to move to the next trial and they would just let the food fall. And definitely the participation waned. So they still came in every day, but they did fewer trials a day. So we typically aim for like 50 trials a day and they were like, eh. And there were these little mounds of like turnip pieces by the touchscreen at the end of each day. So yeah, we try and, and so in fact, the food preference testing is helpful because one of the reasons we did that is we were looking for what's preferred for each individual, but also if there were foods that we could substitute. So, you know, we're trying to use low sugar foods, always low starch foods. So we were looking, for example, um, blueberries 
a, a really preferred food, but it's not as sugary as gravy. So that was really nice for us. We could make these substitutions. Um, and blueberries are really tiny. They don't require cutting up. So our gorillas work for blueberries, which is really remarkable. These are sort of 450, 500 pound animals working for blueberries. So yeah, great question though. Um, and then Jenna asks, does Chimp Haven use the infrared monitors as well, or is that only at Lincoln Park Zoo? Yeah, so the the um, the infrared thing is a project that we have going on at Chimp Haven right now. So yeah, we're just writing up the results of that. So this was a really nice um, grant that we got from the Arcus Foundation. And the aim of the grant was purely to sort of evaluate different welfare evaluation techniques. So it meant we could try um, a, a sort of variety of different things that we might not always have the time or the funds to try. And so the thermal imaging was one of those. So yeah, so our evaluation paper, we've just, this is with, I think I see on the call with Ben Lake, who is on the call here, he led this project. So um, we are just in the final stages of writing up this project and it, and it should come out pretty soon, hopefully. Wonderful. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Okay, if that is the case, then I would like to thank you, Dr. Hopper, again thank for you. coming and talking to us today. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for the great questions. It's really, really nice to see friends here who I haven't seen in a while. So yeah, have a wonderful day, everyone, and, and take care of yourselves at this time. Wonderful. Thank you. You too. And anyone else who would like to attend the next session, it will be at 1230 and it is a pre-recorded video showing. Have a good rest of your day, everyone.